Okay, we're recording now. So I'd like to welcome everybody here today, um, pay uh, acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the lands that we're all meeting on and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And particularly to welcome Claire Tallifson, who's our presenter today, who has very generously and kindly agreed to come out of retirement for one hour for us. I think um, Claire does have by far the most experience of anyone in Australia working with people with deaf blindness on technology. So we are really lucky to have her today and I'll hand over to you, Claire. And just yeah, prompt me through the slides and let me know. Okay, thanks, Meredith. Hello everyone, thanks for coming along to this Zoom meeting. It feels a bit weird to be back in the working seat, but anyway, I'll give it a go. Um, I worked for Able Australia for 20 years and I actually worked for 10 years before that with for our VIB. So I've got 30 years experience with this little cohort. Um, I think about half of my clients were had ushers one, so that's born deaf with RP, and about half were just a whole lot of different different things but nearly all of them were in the community and living you know with their families or alone so that's the context of this presentation um, so first of all I, i'm a really really big 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 champion of um, trying to get the ushers one in particular to learn braille as early as possible i wasn't enormously successful but um, i still am a big champion of it because once they lose their vision and hearing, you know, Braille is their only access to technology. So that's a really big sort of focus for this presentation. I hope that's okay. So I'm up to slide three. So just flick through. You're not in the presentation mode, Mary. Does that matter? Oh, is it? Is it moving over? No, no, it's not. It's you've got to set the slides to go again. Oh, so what's sharing? Just, just if you pick from beginning, will that work? Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. struggling. Okay. In a, That's fine. Uh, yeah, from beginning, yeah. Okay. And then just to, to the to 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 along. Yeah, next one. Okay, okay. Daily living skills. So, um, daily living skills. Have, have never been more important to access via technology as through this pandemic. So if I had been successful and all of the participants that I've worked with over the last 20 years could access all these skills through their technology, their lives probably would have been a little bit better. So um, I really am a big champion for if they're getting NDIS to try and get both core and capacity building supports to transition to using technology for a big range of their daily living skills. So you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, like they really needed to get onto those media briefings through their technology. Um, they always want to check the footy and the cricket, check the weather. Um, if they're out and about, public transport apps are really important. Um, transition to shopping online is really important. Um, and it's all pretty self-evident that all of these um, skills need to be somehow acquired on, on their devices. As well as daily living skills, the next slide, Mary, is communication. So do you want to move to the next slide, Mary? Hello. Sorry, I muted myself and I'm trying to move them over, but it's not. Um... Yeah, you got it. Uh, okay, next one. Has it? Anyway, communication. A lot of the deaf blind um, have lost, when I first meet them or encounter them in their homes, a lot of them have had lost contact with their families and their people that they grew up with, um, friends and services. So technology becomes really important just to even connect with their services. Um, you can't do the next one, Mary? Meredith, if you just it's, press the arrow key um, it, on the right. It's not, my, my computer is really struggling. It keeps freezing. Um, I wonder if I, I might, can I forward it? So where's the arrow? Like I'm using the arrow on the keyboard. I'm just thinking I might forward it to somebody else. It's just frozen. Um, yeah, this has I'm happened to me. I'm happy for you to try forwarding it to me if you like, Meredith. Is that Teresa? 
Trish, Patricia. Oh, Trish. I mean, I okay. can't afford to anyone, but I'm happy yep. to try. Yeah. Well, you can afford it to me too, so I'll have backups. Mm -hmm. yeah. Three. Okay. And now I'm just struggling to even get out of it. Uh, was it was it sent to you? Um, yes, and I just I cannot even. My, well, my Claire, computers. were you able to send it to me? I yeah, I can send it to you. <laughs> oh, that that you. sounds good. And if you just stop sharing your screen, Meredith. Mm hmm I can do that. I'll probably have a go and then <laughs> get stuck as well. <laughs> so who 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 am I sending Patricia, it to? Uh, Patricia dot Roland at Vision Australia dot org. Can you see my name coming up with two L's? Patricia dot Roland, all lowercase at Vision Australia dot org. Are you on the end? Uh, no. And is it Patricia dot Roland? R O L L A N D. Okay. It's not even letting me stop sharing, so it's going to be hard for a new one to share. Uh. Okay, let's, I've just sent that through, Patricia. Okay, thank you. Hey, Meredith, it's Melissa here. I mean, otherwise we just all come, just keep come back in. Yeah, just keep going. I think we might have to do that because um, I've I've hit escape maybe 20 times now and I'm just locked in this. Um, yeah, I can't get out. Oh wait a sec. Yeah, I think I think we might <laughs> we might have to stop and come back. I'm so sorry. That's all right. We can just listen to you if you like. <laughs> yeah, I can just talk. I can just well, talk. Keep you like. keep going, Claire. Yeah, keep going. There's no drama. Okay. So um, so as well as our living skills, communication is a really really big factor. Um, technology just opens their world completely. When I first started working with this group. Um, I got them all into email and, you know, some of them just stayed with about three contacts for about 10 years. Um, but it's still, that was a really, really big change. Um, SMS was a really big change in their lives because they could talk directly to, you know, all of the people that they've lost contact with. But the, really, the biggest change for them was Facebook. Facebook was a really big game changer because they could then start accessing people that they'd gone to school with and some of the older ones could start communicating with their nieces and nephews and their extended family. So all of those changes made a really, really big impact. Um, as well as that, it was probably the first time some of them could work directly with, uh, sorry, communicate directly with their um, peers because most of the time when they go on outings and, and things, they've got um, support workers with them and they've got interpreters and there's a whole lot of other people sort of um, going, you know, translating what's happening around them. So getting on these devices, they could have, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. And then what I noticed was in Facebook, they used to love trawling through all the comments. And, and it's probably the first time they'd sort of got a glimpse of each other's personality in a little bit more detail. It was quite, it was quite fascinating to see. As well as being able to... Um, yeah, oh, which, which one are we up to? This one, this one, this one, yeah. Okay, yay. Let's hope it doesn't okay. work. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, as well as being able to read and read and read and read and, and learn, you know, how other, you know, how other people think and their sense of humour and their views, they also, you know, develop a voice. So when they make their post or create a blog or, um, you know, write something, it's, it's a huge big step for them to actually develop a voice and to become a sort of a digital citizen and start participating. So and I'm sure I'm teaching, I'm saying what everyone knows, but it, it was incredibly transformational within this community. But for next one, please. Yay. But you can't really convince a deafblind person to jump into Facebook or to jump into email or any of this technology if they don't know how it's going to affect them. So 
it, it was a really it was a really big challenge to get them confident to just have a go. So you know, I'm aware that when they are setting their goals for NDIS, often they've got no idea what's out there or, or what's on the horizon that they could possibly achieve. So it is a really tricky thing to get them to, to set their goals before they even know what technology is about. Now, next one, please. Mm -hmm. So how do we get them to embrace it? Because a lot of them would just love to just have a support worker doing everything for them. And, you know, it's quite, for some of them, it's quite a challenge to, you know, to move into this sphere for the first time, or even to transition from doing it with low vision into doing it with Braille. So I want to talk a little bit about how they can learn. So as you can imagine, it's very self-paced, takes a really, really long time. They need to just practice and practice and practice and practice. They need to be playing in a space where they're actually doing something, not learning about what they might be doing. So for example, if they're learning <clears throat> to shop online, they need to actually buy something. If they're learning to do banking, they need to actually you know, pay a bill. They have to actually be doing a task rather than just watching a tutorial about it. Um, Connecting with each other and being inspired by what their peers are doing is also extremely important. So peer mentors are essential. Um, and yeah, basically. Um, they also need help constantly to manage their devices in terms of um, when updates happen, they often lose a bit of their accessibility or things change and they're completely lost. So they've got to go back to square one and work out how to use the device again. So they're pretty high maintenance, but once they learn, you know, it, it, the benefits are amazing. I'm gonna talk about how long it takes the deaf blind community to learn something. Can I just ask a question about mentors? Yes. How, so Theresa, yeah, and how you, Organize, help people to link in with mentors or what kind of mentors people generally find helpful? Okay, so the two mentors, I, 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 um, the, the obvious mentors are other deafblind people. So mm -hmm. we, had a, we had a little drop-in centre, so people would come in from all over Australia and I would then just introduce them to each other and they'd start talking and they'd get on equipment and they'd just learn just by play really and exploration and it was incredibly informal. Um, but also their mentors, are, I, I think that support workers become their mentors. Support workers are with them for a lot of the time. We did one study once where we worked out that about 20% of the time that the support workers were with the clients was explaining concepts about Facebook or explaining stuff about banking and, 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 on, um, and paying bills. So support workers can be encouraged to talk to them a lot about it, to explain conceptually. Um, and family. So everyone around them are mentors in the same way that everyone around us are our mentors. But for some reason, people are hesitant to step into that arena or into that role with people who are deaf and blind. But, you know, we, we, we supported it and we really encouraged it. But we also had a little room, which was a, a really great thing. But I'm going to unpack a little framework just to give you an idea of how long it takes for these guys to learn. So the next slide, please, Meredith. <clears throat> and the next, oh, ooh. okay. This framework was developed in the business world, but it does apply to adult learning. And I think it applies really, really well to people with disabilities. So the framework is 70, 20, 10. And it says that 10% of learning technology is through structured courses and training. 20% of learning technology is social through peers or through others and 70% is through just practicing experience, doing day-to-day -day tasks. The difference between the general community and the deafblind community is that the deafblind people need supports for all of the social and the experiential stuff. So that if they do 10 hours of training, they also need 90 hours or 90% of their time to either talk to other people about things, consolidate what they've learned, but also to practice because they need someone with them to check that what they're doing is correct. So next slide, please, Mary. 
So I've translated this into hours. So just for example, if they set a goal, they might need 10 hours of formal structured training. They will then also, for everything they learn in that 10 hours, they'll need 20 hours with their peers or even with their supports or with their family. And then 70 hours just practicing it. But they also need a support person to do that 70 hours, which is absolutely phenomenal. And it does sound like it's completely over the top, but that was basically the experience that, um, that I had for many of the clients, not all, but for many of them. The next slide, please. I've translated this into um, learning internet banking. And I'm a big, a big champion of in internet banking because I do think that, well, particularly in, the, in the, this pandemic, a lot of places won't take cash. Um, a lot of the clients are stuck on passbook accounts and they are still paying their bills at the post office via a cheque. Now, at some point in the very near future, that's all going to come to a big halt. Either post offices or post offices are closing, so there's fewer places that they can actually drive to to pay their bills. There's fewer um, people that will even accept cheques, and everyone is transitioning into this way of, of paying bills, and so it's something that, I'm, that I really, really think that they should be doing. So I've broken it down to... Um, uh, under the NDIS, it's, it's assistance with daily life. And I think that a lot of the supports to use their technology to do these skills should come under their core supports. As well as that, it comes under the capacity building supports um, under improved daily living skills. So I've just broken up 10 tasks that they might want to achieve under internet bill paying and said, well, they might need one-on-one -on -one training to get around the accessibility issues and their technology to do these tasks. But for each of those one hours, they really need another nine hours, either talking to people about it, talking to their peers, talking to their family, talking to their supports, but also with their support workers watching what they're doing. And it's fairly, and so that comes up to a hundred hours of supports. Next slide, please. Question again, Claire. Another question, yeah. And they, this is really relevant for me at the moment because I'm having to, um, with Karen's help, ask for a change of circumstances because the technology side has really taken a lot, lot of therapy time up for one of my clients. So I'm wondering how, like what, if you use any evidence within your, say, NDIS um, applications, or how you justify to the NDIS the number of hours required for technology training? Have you got any recommendations? Because it's a lot, isn't it? It is a lot, yeah, it is a lot. Um, yeah, yeah it, it, this is the big problem because, um, you know, in a lot of ways they, they, they work better. I mean, even the clients themselves would never ever admit that that's what they need or acknowledge or be aware that that's what they need. Hmm. Um, it's just that that's what I, I don't actually. I'm sorry, I don't really have any evidence. Um, it's just it might what be around deafblind learning, I guess. That there is there any like if I were to try and present any evidence or to build a case, is there any where that I can refer to? Do you think? Uh, I, I not for expert. <laughs> Your expertise. <laughs> it's, I'll, I'll, it's Meredith, I'll have you come back. Yeah, it's Meredith okay. speaking. Um, so we've recently put a submission in to the um, NDIS review of uh, support coordination, but there's quite a lot of information in that submission that talks about how challenging it is for a person with a deaf blindness to learn anything and all the reasons, the language breakdown, using interpreters, there's so much more communication breakdown. It just takes longer. So I will send you that submission and you might be able to cite that in your Thank you. review, in, like the, for the NDIS. Um, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll, we'll, I'll come, I'll, be, I'll think about it and I'll revisit it, but I'll just keep going. Um, with internet bill paying, but I just want to sort of alert you to the fact that even before the client decides, yes, I'll do it, there's a whole lot of prerequisites that have to be lined up. For example, a lot of them have still got passbook, passbook accounts. And unfortunately, everyone who moved into credit card 
or getting credit or statement accounts or credit card accounts. Um, they usually did it on the back of telephone banking. And so none of these clients had telephone banking. So when they come up, go, visit the bank with their passport to get onto internet banking, they then have to go through this rigorous identity check, you know, with pass with driver's license and passports and the whole work. So that's big first hurdle number one. But then in a mobile phone, um, and they need a mobile phone for internet banking because they get their, you know, security pins through their mobile phone. They need to know how to drive it. They need an Apple ID or a Google a Google Play account so they can download the app. Um, and yeah, and then they need lots and lots of support. And the scary thing is, you know, they're they're having to trust their supports to be seeing, you know, all their banking details. So it's a really, 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 really big ask. But I've picked a very hard example um, just to show you, you know, you know, just how difficult it is. Um, of course, with other apps, you know, all these security issues aren't such a big deal. But I do think we need to embrace it. Otherwise, this whole community is just going to be left out in the wilderness. Um, the next one, Mary. Um, I'm a huge champion of the smartphone only because I saw how it changed their lives absolutely completely. And I do think the smartphone is an essential device. Now, I was very on the front foot at encouraging the clients to just go off and buy them themselves. I actually used to tell them that the blind pension was for smartphones. So they just had to go out and buy them. If they can't get them under the NDIS, they need to buy it themselves. In a lot of cases, a lot of families will give them an older smartphone and that's how they can start. So they are something that's around and available. And that didn't that became the least of my worries getting them getting them access to a smartphone. The smartphone, next one please, Mary, works for this group because of the flexibility around how to use the phone. I mean it sounds it seems like it's a really hard device to use, but deafblind people have a whole range of disabilities and you need a whole lot of flexibility around their inputs. So for example, they can use the stylus or they can use the virtual keyboard or they can use a QWERTY keyboard or they can use a braille keyboard. And you know, you'd be surprised that some of them have learned, you know, what they've learned in life has been pretty ad hoc and some of them only know how to do braille typing or some of them only know how to do QWERTY typing or whatever. They, and some of them might even be able to use speech. So the iPhone has all of those inputs and then with outputs, it's got magnification, high contrast, speech and braille. So you can tweak it. You can even plug an iPhone into a TV or a computer monitor so that they can see it really big. In fact, I used to teach them how to use um, phones by sticking them under a CCTV and then they could, you know, explore what was going on under the CCTV. So that's its flexibility. Next one, please, Mary. Um, it also pairs with their hearing aids. Um, it's got vibration. Uh, but the best thing is that it's got access to all these apps and the apps are what give them daily living skills and independence. And the third really big feature of an iPhone is that, or it doesn't have to be an iPhone, just a smartphone, is that all of their family and their supports uh, have got the same, advice, same device. And so they've got 90% of the knowledge to help them. I've even had, next slide please, I've even had um, examples where clients, a deafblind person has had a, a smartphone when they didn't even know how to drive it themselves. And it worked really, really well, particularly if they're living alone, because the different supports that come every day could just pick up the phone and read their messages and get a feel for what's actually happening, who they've heard from, what needs to be followed up, and they can read the conversation thread so that they know exactly what's going on. Often the client will be really stressed, you've got to ring my daughter, and they won't explain what's going on. So the, the support worker can actually follow it. The support worker could assist them to pay bills, book appointments, interpreters, and do all that stuff on the phone and explain everything they're doing. The client themselves could use the fingerprint for ID. And it really isn't a, much different to actually taking them to the bank or taking them to the shops or taking them to the services physically. Next one, please. So for the ones that, with Usher's one or the ones that are, you know, losing their vision, they really need to learn Braille. I mean, I would love it if they learned Braille when they were 12, but um, most deaf people, they've never seen Braille, they don't know what it is. Um, a lot of them can't learn through traditional ways. Um, a lot of the Braille teaching materials, 
focus purely on grade two and they, uh, they assume a level of literacy that's much higher than this cohort. So I always try and convince them that grade one is enough. If they're just using it for SMS, grade one is plenty. A lot of them aren't readers, they're not reading books, they're not, they're not needing to have grade two. And grade two was only really invented so that um, books, when they were printed, didn't take up you know, too much room. So grade one is enough. I mean, I'm not saying people shouldn't learn grade two. If they, if they learn grade one in a day, we'll absolutely move them on to grade two. But if they're really struggling to learn just the alphabet, and it is just the alphabet, it's not a language, it's just A to Z. And there's a lot of repetition once you learn A to J. I always, I, I used to spend a lot of time trying to get the supports to learn Braille. There's some really fun apps that will teach you Braille. Um, they can learn it visually and they can be, you know, and they love it. You know, the young ones love learning new languages. If they all had a Perkins typewriter, that's like a pen and paper, they could get their grandkids and all their family to learn, you know, just to type a few things, type some letters, uh, bring Braille into the house, like Braille label up their food items, their cans of, you know, thin tomatoes and whatever. Um, and we also used to have this wonderful little program where the ones that were learning would write a letter to the ones that were visiting the link and then they'd just share correspondence on, on paper written in Braille. And that was a really good way to get people interested. The next slide, please. Excuse me, Claire. It's yes, Karen yeah. speaking. Just to share a, a good news story, I guess, on that, on that topic. Um, one of our clients, uh, Asha Wan, who is 60, and one of his goals was to learn grade one. Well, what we explained to him is grade one, that that was a good fit, and we got it included in the plan. The training is being delivered by another deafblind person, and um, being funded to do that. So it's, it's a real success story, and he is just doing amazingly well he's picked it up so quickly i'm super impressed so what you're talking about can happen under ndis and it can work really really well for the benefit of that cohort yeah it's absolutely perfect perfect story that's that's what that's what should happen everywhere um the, the clients themselves teach it really well to each other and they're very very creative i had one guy brought in a, a six uh like a carton of eggs, a six pack of eggs, and he had little ping pong balls in there. And that is the braille cell. And they just used to play with these ping pong balls, you know, moving them around to make the different letters. They're very, very creative. Um, it's very hard to learn with paper. So using a braille display would be great for learning because the braille dots are really, really crisp. And some of the older people have trouble feeling the dots and they get really, really um, frustrated. So. But yeah, teaching each other, that's the perfect story, Karen. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Braille displays are just a piece of hardware and they connect via Bluetooth to a smartphone or they also connect to uh, an iPad or a, or a tablet or a computer. Um, they're not hugely expensive, I don't think, compared to what they used to be You know, when I first started out. And they're pretty great way to start so um and and we, i used to use them in our in my center to teach them braille as well and the clients to teach each other braille because because um they could just write something down and then try and read it back and then um they, they weren't having to wade through these big you know resources that they couldn't follow the instructions on um, and and also the support workers could sit with them and help them out with, um, with what they were doing the next one please Oh, I'm missing one. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, the other really big thing they loved is wearable tech. Um, so I'll just go through these really quickly because I know the time's running out. Um, a ditto is just this tiny little, like a little tiny watch that they wear on their wrist and they can, and it vibrates through, um, it connects to the uh, smartphone through Bluetooth and then any notification from any app can be selected to vibrate. So mostly it was just to alert them when they had a new SMS text. But as well as that, one guy used it whereby he, um, sorry, he, he um, if, if he had a phone call, uh, you know, voice call, it would vibrate 
And what he did was on his front door, he just put his mobile phone number and said, I'm deaf, can you please ring this number? And then as soon as his ditto vibrated, he knew there was someone standing in his front door. So that was a pretty clever little invention. And they are really inventive with how they use these devices. But basically, um, you could probably, uh, probably maybe an alarm clock you could use it for, possibly. But um, mostly it was just apps that they could configure to, to work with the ditto. Um, Apple Watches and um, Samsung Watches, they absolutely love because, um, you know, it's, I don't know, I think they've just had such limited access to technology. You know, they've always had to have wait for someone to turn it on or set it up or, or get it going that they just love the wearable stuff that they can, that, that, that's, that's theirs. They love Fitbits. Um, a lot of them, all they do really is walk, you know, and go out and some of them really want to get fit and they love tracking how many steps they've done over the week and, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. The Sunu band for mobility is um, some of them like that, although, although the app is very voice driven, so it's not all available in Braille. And even the mini guide, which is just a handheld mobility aid, they really love that too. Um, when they used to come to the centre, they always used that inside the building because they, were, they had to go to a shared kitchen and shared toilet and stuff. Okay, the next one. Um, alarm clocks. So I just want to talk a little bit about these. We we just we um, they all loved using the mobile phone with its vibrational facility as an alarm clock until I discovered that they were putting the phone under their pillows and also on charge. <laughs> oh my god, how scary is that? So we found these little these little devices that connect to the phone via Bluetooth and you put the little shaker thing under the pillow. Um, but you still sort of drive it with the phone. So that works really well. That's not very expensive. It's a bit tricky to configure, but um, that's where the support's come in to help them. And I also want to put in this Helen vibrating alarm clock. This doesn't, this is just a standalone piece of technology. It doesn't, doesn't need an, a mobile phone. And um, it's about the only vibrating alarm clock that I'm aware of in the world. And it costs $700. And I think that if there's a deafblind person and all they want is an alarm clock, I think I think go for it because um, I, I've met so many deafblind people that don't even have the control in their lives to be able to wake up when they want to wake up, and that becomes the thing that they really really want most in life. Um, I've even written the instructions because they're so amazing how how it all works. The person needs to be a little bit on the ball to understand it because it's all done through vibrations, um, but it's, it's very clever. And I think, oh yes, brown note takers. Okay, the next one please, Mary. Um, brown note takers, I have to be upfront and tell you I'm just not a fan of these at all. They are marketed as a deafblind communicator, but I have had very, very, very limited success with these, with this cohort. Um, basically, they, 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 assume a lot of knowledge of computers. Um, they are designed for speech and the Braille is just an add-on and I find that they're incredibly difficult to learn. And nowadays, I think they are just a Samsung, I know, a um, Android tablet. And then to make the Braille functional, they put this hard keyboard on top and you don't even have a screen. So I think they would be much better off with a Braille display and a tablet so that whoever's supporting them can actually see what's happening. So they're very, very expensive, very complicated, and you know, they're just, um, they have a very short shelf life too, because once you buy them, you really can't update them or do anything with them. And they don't have the flexibility of inputs and outputs like a phone and a braille display do. And similarly with the L braille, the L braille is amazing, but it's, you'd have to, You'd have to be quite young and have a fantastic memory to remember all the Braille commands because it's a very, very, very complex machine. Okay, that's it. I got there. Thank you so much, Claire. It's fantastic. I'm sure, well, I expect got people got got some questions yeah, or I, comments. I you, you've sped through really well. Um, I didn't want to talk too long. No, it's, it's so good. So. Um, 
can yeah do, do people have any questions for Claire or comments I loved your comment Karen that's so exciting to hear what's what's happening over there yeah. really good news um, I mean can I just add to that I mean that's also a pathway to employment for the person that's training training um, doing the training which is fantastic absolutely and you know We've quoted on, on the plan at a, you know, a reasonable training rate. We quoted what I know private contractors charge and it was all approved. And we, um, we got 10 blocks of four sessions, uh, sorry, four blocks of 10 sessions in the 12 month period of the plan. So we got 40 lessons, which I'm hoping will be sufficient to get him set up and certainly the way he's going it will and we also asked for some extra com guide hours so the com guide could be there for the lesson as well as yeah. the interpreter but so the yeah. com guide could be there for the lesson and they could sort of get into it as you were saying claire as well so yeah, we, yeah. it was one of the lucky ones that we we got him streamed as complex and there was recognition of those unique needs and yeah it was one of the one of the one of the positive one so it was a great outcome it's a fantastic outcome and and seriously next year he could have another 40, another 40 hours just learning the iphone you know for sms and then the following year for email and the following year for you know yeah you, you got me thinking actually when you were talking and i thought next plan we'd have to look at one of those braille notes because he doesn't have that we got money for a perkins and we haven't even got that yet it's just well, doing everything just back. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get a braille note seriously i really would get a braille display oh sorry yes that's, that's what i meant the braille yeah. display yeah maybe that would be a really natural next step for him yeah. after you know the the full 12 months of yeah. learning as he is but i've just been astounded how quickly he has picked it up it he's amazing like heaps better than me <laughs> So yeah, it's it's finding that potential and 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 helping people to discover that potential within themselves and explaining what the benefit of doing it would be because as you know, Claire, you know a lot of people braille. Why would I want to learn braille? You know, that's for blind people. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. and explaining how it would help him. He's a he's a, a stamp collector and a coin collector and. That was sort of how it initially came into the conversation that we could label all of his pieces so he can find them, be able to find them easy and continue doing the hobby that he loves. That was sort of how the conversation started. Yeah. Well done. That's fantastic. And hi, Claire. It's Melissa here. And oh, hi, Melissa. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Um, your wealth of knowledge is amazing. One of the big things is that really struck me was your list of the amount of hours that realistically that we should be allocating. And I think that gives us um, a lot more strength behind actually really putting forward realistic timeframes for these guys to actually um, achieve these goals. And yeah. I think for me, I, I thought I was being generous with what I was sort of coming up with hours. And I think, you know, looking at those, I'm going, actually, I've underestimated this um, big time. So um, thank you so much for that, because I think we need to have that. Um, we, we need to give them enough time for that learning potential. And I really don't know whether that's something, I think we're sort of all cautious of, we want this to get through, so we don't want it to be ask for so many that we think that they're just going to yeah. knock us back point blank. But I think we should just power through and say, this is, this is what they need. And I think as Karen said, the complexity of the client, we need to reinforce that these guys, it's, it's a unique situation, but the complexity is, um, is so high. It is really high. Yeah. I mean, even SMS, I mean, we just sort of pick it up and learn it in about five minutes, but yeah. some of the clients just take forever to learn how to do it. I mean, partly it's because they can't see what they're doing and, um, you know, the, the steps aren't intuitive, but they've got to learn the language, reply, forward, delete, you know, it's all new to them, completely new if they haven't used computers before. So there's a lot of layers that you've got to unpack as you're teaching it. And, and it might take them a whole year just to be confident with their SMS. Yeah. It's Meredith speaking. So 
following on from that point exactly, and also what you were asking about earlier, Teresa, I think the NDIS and the average planner or the person signing off on the plan does not comprehend or understand all the, the basic knowledge that Auslan users are often missing out on that we take for granted. And I was speaking to an interpreter the other day and she said it was put really well to her once. If you think of a 40 year old person and ask them, now imagine what you would know if you didn't know anything you'd ever um, heard from television. Now imagine if not having heard anything on the radio, not having overheard any conversations. There's just often this base knowledge that we assume people have that they don't have. And it's that going back to unpacking and checking all the way and working very closely and systematically with someone, making sure that they have that, those base concepts and being really observant to check if there's something missing and checking if you need to go back a step to, to explain stuff. And I'm, I mean, I'm sure you had that experience all the time, Claire. I think just exactly what you said then, the getting around a phone, like those, those concepts. And when you add, add vision impairment, it just, it's really complex and difficult. And the other thing too is like, even if they've used a phone with their vision, they've just recognised icons. Whereas when they need to do it with Braille, they actually have to learn the names of all the icons. And that's just to learn new language for them, really. And I mean, um, you know, like compose is for a new SMS, you know, all those words, you know, they're all new words that they have to learn. And I think about banking, like when I do banking, you know, I don't know what a remitter is and a transaction and a debtor and, a, you know, payee and a pay you know all those all those words are new to me and we just somehow absorb them and learn them you know much more quickly because we can see them but for for these guys i mean they've never done any of that sort of stuff they've just gone to the bank passed their book through and got it back we've got to learn the whole language around banking it's incredible really yeah so it's a big it's a, i don't know i don't know why people don't understand it takes a long time I mean, we all spend hours and hours and hours on our devices sometimes just to fix a little problem. So, you know, we are all spending a lot of time on technology, um, just not counting it, I suppose. This is a very special chance to have Claire here. So if you've got any questions, even if you want to um, put them in the chat. Yeah. Um, Sorry, it's Melissa again. Um, Claire, one of the things, again, I think, the group, you know, one of the terminologies you used was social and experimental experience. And that social experience with peers and things actually was another thing that struck home to me because unfortunately in the world of NDIS, a lot of our clients now are a bit more isolated from each other because mm -hmm. we're not bringing them together for these things. And that struck me as a very important way for them as part of their learning and that engagement and feeling part of a digital community um, is a really strong and powerful thing. And unfortunately, the way funding models are now, you know, we're not getting these, these environments that, where we can get people together. Um, luckily, I know with DeafBlind Victorians and particularly with um, the DeafBlind West Australian group, which is slowly becoming more stronger and independent themselves, we will start to have the opportunity to do that. But that definitely all sort of fell into a little bit of a hole during that time when suddenly it all changed over and we lost that ability to really flexibly all get together and that social thing. Yeah. The social thing is so powerful and it's not um, like at the link, if, if, if there were two clients there, they often wouldn't even in, interact with each other. So I would sit them down and I would, you know, supervise, force or <laughs> cajole them into actually talking to each other. And that's how they learned about tactile signing. Like if someone wasn't signing hands on, they go, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. I can't do that. And then we would just sit together and very quietly and, and you know, support them to actually interact. And it was scary. I mean, I've been in the room many times. It's quite incredible when I've been travelling around the country where two people who have known each other for 20 years and they've been in meetings together for 20 years have never actually had a conversation together. So it's not just the technology. It's at the centre, we did a lot of face-to-face -face stuff as well. You know, we just 
broke down those barriers of fear around communicating with each other. And also at the very beginning, they were very fearful and protective about what they didn't know or what they did know and how much they could see or how much they could hear or what their skill acquisition was. And they were very um, nervous about disclosing any of that to each other. So it was a massive big learning, you know, social experience for all of them. It was, it was quite incredible. Yeah, and, and there's just a lot of what they're learning was just um, one-upmanship and bragging and, you know, um, feeling really proud and, um, and a lot of play, lots of play, lots of play. It was all just exploring mm -hmm. and, and it was amazing. And it was also amazing because I came in as the expert, whereas I, hadn't, I, had, I wouldn't have had a clue what would work for each individual. And so I would just put everything in front of them and eventually they would make it, they'd be confident enough to make a choice. And I was always really surprised at what their choices were. I would never have recommended most of the, most of the yeah. things that they picked up, but um, it, it worked. Yeah. Could you give an actual example of that, Claire, where they chose something that surprised you? Like what, what they chose over what you would have thought? Well, when I first started working there, it was a real push to get Zoom text. Zoom text was the big thing. This is a good example. Um, and put Zoom text on everything because Zoom text makes everything really, really big. But the reality is they, yeah. they had RP and RP doesn't benefit from having things really big. So um, they could, they, vision, they had quite, quite good clarity. So they didn't really want things really big. They wanted to just keep things just a, just a little bit bigger, not, not really, really big because they wanted to see the context of the whole screen. But secondly, they didn't actually want to pay for Zoom text and they didn't want to have an overlay of a piece of software. So they spent a lot of time, heaps and heaps of time, um, just tweaking with the Windows environment, you know, all the accessibility features within Windows and every single element on the screen, they would make their own colour or their own size. And that was really, really important. Whereas I wouldn't have put a lot of emphasis on doing that. Um, that, 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 that worked really, really well. Um, they tended to love getting stuff for free, you know, mainstream stuff, you know, so if they needed magnification, they just used to use the Windows Magnifier or find some other generic pieces of software that could magnify. Um, I had one guy I taught, I, t I thought he was totally blind and I taught him for, and he didn't know the, how to type, didn't know the QWERTY keyboard. I taught him for a whole year just typing, just that's all I did. Then one day I saw him at a computer and he had his magnifying glass, you know, running over the computer and he could read or, and recognise icons on the computer. And that just blew my mind. I thought, well, if he can see a little bit and, and a lot of them just use a handheld magnifier to see around the screen what, what was going on. And I would never have thought of that ever. Um, but what the first thing he then did was he started to learn how to make animated mouse pointers in football colours. <laughs> And that's what he learned. He went from being totally blind and just learning to type to getting onto a computer and, and making the mouse pointer a big rectangle that blinked in his, you know, Melbourne colours or Carlton colours or whatever he, whatever team he followed. So, you know, it was just, it, from then on, I thought, well, it's free for all. They can do what they like because they're having fun and it, they're learning. And they still use those animated mouse pointers to this day. It's quite incredible. And they still use a handheld magnifier. Um, I would never have thought of any of those things. I, I really love that point, Claire, that, um, you know, it took you a year just working on access before you got to using yeah. the device. That, that that's part of the issue is the access and that that's why Braille's so important that potentially that will be their, their need for access. Mm. But I did actually move very quickly into teaching them the Braille on their devices, which was pretty interesting because the Braille devices give a really lovely um, crisp dot <laughs> because working on paper can be quite hard work because the Braille is quite flat. The dots are quite flat on paper, but on the Braille displays, they're, they're quite, um, but you need a little bit of expertise to do all that. But I used to just get them to read their emails in, with Braille and then type the reply and then read back their reply in Braille. So it was text that they were familiar with and then they could practice reading the Braille that way on, on the devices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Any final um, questions or comments for Claire while she's here? I, I don't have the next date in front of me, but I'm pretty sure it's another um, ex-ABLE staff member. I think I'm pretty sure it's Emily Walters is coming back to do a session on creative arts therapy and people with sensory disabilities. Um, and then I think it's o and at the end of the year, but I'll, I'll send the video out um, and Claire's PowerPoint and the dates for the next session. But yeah, still got sorry, another. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry, it's Melissa again. Sorry, Claire. Um, that's actually really interesting. But um, so I suppose most of the people that I've experienced that are using their Braille devices, of course, I've never thought of someone who's only ever done it on paper and moving to a um, digital based Braille device and the sense of touch that they're experiencing, I'm sure is actually quite different. But so I've got someone in the lower southwest here that um, I he is, you know, at the moment using a Perkins, he's always used the Perkins and he's never moved on. And of all the things I put down in my schedule of, of different things to be aware of, I didn't actually think in my head about the fact that the touch experience is going to be quite different from that pinpoint of a digital based device to the rounded, slightly rounded, much softer ones on paper. But, but also, as well as that, um, I had a guy who could type, you know, a million miles an hour on a Perkins, and then I moved him onto a Braille device. And he just couldn't learn the keyboard. Like he, he took he took ages and ages and ages to learn how to type on the keyboard because it was a different feel and he couldn't yeah. he couldn't put that in his mind, the Perkins keyboard to this braille to this little braille display keyboard. And it, I he spent weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah, because well, he just couldn't even recognise because there were eight keys. Yep. And the action was really different. And and the thing about it was that he'd been taught on the Perkins one fingered. And he was typing oh. like one fingered. Oh, okay. And then when he went to the brow display, he couldn't do one fingered because there was too many little keys. Yeah. And he had to then go from one finger typing to three finger three. typing. That. And that was a, a huge transition for him. Mm -hmm. And it was only that I recognised it and persevered with him for ages. And then once he got the hang of it, he he flew. But it took him a really long time to learn that. Mm -hmm. And I had another. I've got another. Had another client who learned braille um, just by reading it. And she'd never typed it, and she didn't know that that you could transpose these dots into a keyboard and type them. And so she was just using a QWERTY keyboard with her phone because that's all she knew. But eventually, she worked out and taught herself how to do the braille typing. She was so excited, but it took her forever. So yeah, these access issues are, are really, really major. And yeah. we'd need to let the NDIS know it takes a long time. <laughs> It just does. It's a really long time, but I do think that um, it's very, very. Uh, the first thing I do is get them to the like the very first day with the brow display. I get them to send a text message, and I get them to read a reply, and it, absolutely the lights just go on, mm -hmm. and that's all the motivation they need, and they completely get it, and they're flying. So it's a great motivator to just put a phone and a brow display in their hands or an iPad in their hands straight away and get them get them seeing how it works yeah. and you know seeing is doing it means everything to them mm. and then they, they they just you can't stop them then <laughs> it's very exciting mm. yeah we've got on there but the, sorry you go well and also like the, don't underestimate the power of the support workers because they've all got smartphones they've all got voiceover on their smartphones they end up being able to learn how to use them and then even if they could play with the brow display until the client's ready for it, they'll mm. learn it. They, they're very, very, they're very clever. And there's a lot of stuff available online now to teach them. And, you know, that can be a great resource. Thanks, Claire. That's just been super helpful. And I miss you so much. <laughs> it's great to get in I don't, I I don't want to end on a negative note, but... I feel this has highlighted, again, um, a real sense of urgency about these impending changes around the independent assessors, because there ain't no way that's going to be part of an assessment. So I guess I'm just leaving that, that note for everybody that, you know, we, we just absolutely 
have to be pushing back so hard? You know, in, in all honesty, whenever a client wanted to buy a new piece of equipment, I would gather a whole range of stuff and let them, and let them take them home. Sometimes I take them home for six months or, or they would come to Melbourne and they'd meet other clients who had different pieces of equipment and the clients would do a show and tell them their equipment and tell them all of the good reasons for buying it. Like it was the clients themselves who were doing the research and the exploration mm -hmm. and trying the, the equipment before they buy them because they were just full of fear that they couldn't manage them or they wouldn't do what they wanted them to do and they, they just they needed to play with them to, to be able to make those sorts of decisions. And so really an good. independent assessor isn't going to, yeah. Do you know? No, the client always decided mm -hmm. what they wanted. Claire, anyway, um, thank, you for, thank you for the time. I've it's heard a you. In my retirement. <laughs> I've heard you speak so many times, and it's always an absolute joy. And I learn something every single time. So we're we're hugely grateful that you gave up an hour of your retirement to come back for us today. And it, I think, um, yeah, just from the, the comments and feedback, it's been really well received. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. And I'll, yeah, I'll send the recording and Claire's PowerPoint out to everybody um, soon. Thanks okay. so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks, see everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.